Aloha and uh, welcome to Politics for the People. Uh, this is uh, March 3rd, 2022, and I'm Stephanie Dalton, and I'm your host for this weekly show. Our topic today is uh, the painful consequences of global politics, and particularly today for Ukraine, as it is relentlessly attacked by Russia. To to, to discuss uh, these, these politics and, and how they distribute pain and what that might mean and affect uh, the international situation and us here at home, um, I welcome a panel of guests, including Jay Fidel and Tim Apicella and Karen Buzzer. Thank uh, you all for participating. Well, let me begin, Jay, uh, with you and ask you, whose policy in whose policy uh, internationally now is assigning pain? We could talk about what that might mean. Who's who's doing who's creating the pain as a result of their politics now, Jay? Can you comment on well, that? Well, it's geopolitics and it's your friend uh, of Vladimir Putin. Um, and, um, you know, I have to say that I used to think he was, uh, I mean, a, a day or two ago, I used to think he was out of his mind. Um, but I no longer think that. I mean, you know, if you start connecting the dots on him, uh, you realize that it's it's all pre pre organized. It's he has a specific intention in mind. He's a monster. Um, but that doesn't mean he's crazy, you know, um, and and what and what is uh, instrumental on that for me is that um, a few days ago he threatened nuclear war. He said, "Don't forget, Russia is Russia is a nuclear power," and that is before we saw that he was, you know, devastating Ukraine, devastating it, um, you know, shooting uh, cluster bombs at civilians. Uh, um, firing rockets into residential buildings, uh, just making it into a, a rubble-filled parking lot. That's what he's doing. It's, it's extraordinary. It's, it's so mean, it's, it's hard to believe. But at the time he said that Russia was a nuclear power, it hadn't been made clear. Uh, one could still think for a moment that he was attacking the Ukraine, Ukrainian military, military facilities. Uh, you know, it, it all turns into a blur, but at some at some point we thought that, and then later we found that no, he was attacking civilians indiscriminately, or maybe I should say discriminately. He was leveling the country. So it was at this point, I believe, when all that was clear, that he made that crack about nuclear power, okay? So why would he have made that crack? Because he's crazy? No, it's because he felt that what he was about to do and just starting to do was going to offend the world, especially Western Europe, so much that they would think about breaking their, and the US, about breaking their original you know, decision not to put boots on the ground. I think he, he was concerned that there would be boots on the ground. And they would be coming in to attack him, or rather counterattack him, inside of Ukraine. That's why he said, we are a nuclear power, to def deflect and deter Western Europe from doing that, um, deflect and deter Biden from doing that. And indeed, you know, as, as, as this is so horrendous that it, it is inevitable that you would think, hey, how do we save these people? Sanctions aren't really saving them. Um, they're dying in the streets, in the subways, they're dying. They're dying from hunger and health, lack of clean water, and it will get worse. And that's what Putin wants. Remember Stalin in 1932, how he intentionally starved out the Ukrainians and then replaced them with Russians. And that's why there are so many Russians in Ukraine today, because Stalin killed a lot of Ukrainians by intentional starvation. Okay? So I think people remember that. And I think um, it, he's not crazy to threaten atomic war because he fears that Western Europe is going to change its mind about boots on the ground. 
because he fears the U.S. as a moral matter may ultimately change its mind about boots on the ground. If he continues what he's doing, it is an issue that is raised for all of us. Chilling comments, Jay. Thank you. Um, well, Tim, would you um, speak to the motivations um, of this of this tyrant or this autocrat? And um, in, indeed, if if there are pain, if there is pain from from political decisions and, and perhaps unavoidable pain, the kind of pain that's being distributed now on. You mean you mean like death pain? Uh, you mean you mean the, the pain of being killed? That pain is that what you're talking about? All the pains you listed, Jay. All all of that torment that's being visited yeah. on those people. I, I would I would have to say that death is the ultimate pain. Anybody disagree? Oh, well, this yes. stuff can be uncomfortable too. I mean, uh, death yeah. is not. It, no, it's it's living through what you've suffered through and not dying. That's the ultimate pain. Uh, your, your limbs are blown off and you're, you know, on a ventilator, um, death would be welcomed. Oh, yeah. So what does that tell you? Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about, uh, Tim, talk about then where is the, the mind of this man? And, and given that the, the leaders have to make decisions that do a lot of pain, uh, but what, what, what's going on with him? Is there no? Right. Well, it's, well, I think it's obvious. You know, about a month ago, um, we did a show on What Now America, and the title was Make USSA, USSR Great Again, Invade Ukraine. And we had some fun with that title, but the title really was dead on. And, and Jay's right. He's not crazy. He's crazy like a fox. And, you know, he's ex-KGB. He wants the glory of the USSR back again. And Ukraine is the first step to do that, as was Germany taking Austria. Um, that's he wants his satellite states back again, and he wants USSR to stand up as a world power of which it's not any longer. And that is Putin. That's what Putin's all about. He knows that you know the system under the Soviet system, the economic system, was you couldn't. It wasn't sustainable. He knows that on one hand, but then again, he he pines and longs for those days. So he's a he's a man who's mixed with his emotions and what he wants for for Russia, and that is his sole purpose. Um, there might be Jay suggested yesterday that um, there might be another you know hidden agenda there, and that is uh, raw materials for computer chips. Uh, Jay said that the Ukraine is the what is it? Jay, the, the what material is that? Lithium. So, lithium. Lithium. <laughs> that Ukraine is the largest source of lithium, and and you, we know that China has been uh, cornering that market in Africa and around the world for years, and 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 Putin realizes that petrodollars are going to come to an end sooner or later, so he needs to branch out and 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 get another monopoly somewhere where he can have the world at his beck and call because he has the supply. So that might be a partial reason why he's doing what he's doing. But I think it's all about Russia pride, the, the glory of the Soviet Union, and how, how his neighboring countries quaked and feared under the uh, Russian bear. OK. Well, I, I hear you saying that th this certain, certainly war has been waged on less justifiable uh, uh, desires or goals. Oh, In other absolutely. words, it would be lithium. To, to make his, uh, what, a New Jersey-sized economy thrive. Um, I've heard that it's uh, so, sort of like New Jersey. Maybe, maybe it's- Well, I think he wants to turn that into a California economy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, all right, then, then what, where does this put us? Um, Karen, how about talking about the morality of this in relation to the distribution of pain that is necessary? In certain um, well, I think uh, there are kind of two competing versions of reality with this uh, conflict. One is that you know Russia is a oppressor, like like has been discussed, and there's a desire by Putin to be aggressive and to take over more territory and expand his empire, kind of thing. And the other side is that Russia does have legitimate security concerns because we the NATO has pushed right to its surrounded it and pushed to the border. And I think it's possible to- Let me go on record to say I completely disagree with you, Karen, but that's okay. 
Okay, so I think one uh, to be quite of a, a, you know, contrary and uh, to some of the points, I think you can say both is true without, uh, you know, saying that you agree with Russia or Putin. He's obviously um, is reacting to a policy that uh, US has implemented toward militarism and NATO by, uh, you know, extreme measures and one cannot go along in any way condone the measures he's taken so i think that uh you have to kind of look at both sides of the issue and not just one side because i do think that uh a lot of it is the result of u.s policies uh which has been to push nato right up to the very back door of uh putin and even uh, condoleezza rice during the bush administration made a comment that uh, Ukraine was a very red line for Putin even wet back then and he's made I think he made it clear and I think the other issue is having a kind of weak a negotiator with Anthony Blinken was that his name yeah. uh, Anthony Blinken said two years ago that he uh, the only way he would negotiate with Russia was with a gun to its head with to Putin's head. So I don't think that's a good starting point for a negotiation if you really want to try to resolve it in a non-military way, which I think there had to be more of a attempt to um, a discussion about what could resolve it in a more peaceful way without uh, bringing in the P Putin sort of exercising this tyrannical role of bringing in the military. Um, so I think that's kind of the pain is that uh, none of this is this kind of, to me, the kind of extreme polarization of these points of view, two points of view. Erin, I wanted to ask you about the NATO issue for Putin and what is the affront to him by NATO when all of these... Uh, uh, well, he has, uh, if you look at the uh, expansion of NATO, originally it was like 15 and now it's 30 states, but the original agreement was just Western Europe, they would have NATO bases, particularly Germany. And since then, there's been a, a US policy of expanding NATO, which is essentially uh, military, to uh, areas around Russia, Eastern and Eastern Europe. So gradually, it's been expanded to um, closer and closer to the borders of Russia. And there's been a lot of articles written, academic articles, I might add, that's warned the US that this was a dangerous policy it was following, that they shouldn't provoke Russia, um, that they didn't really need these NATO bases right next door to um, Russia, and that uh, you know we had really no real interest in Ukraine per se. Uh, so uh, you know why provoke it? You know what I think the negotiating point was they wanted uh, he wanted a commitment that. Ukraine would remain neutral, not take a position toward the West or toward Russia either way, which uh, Blinken was not able to negotiate because he wouldn't put it on the table. So um, I think there's um, kind of, um, in the time of war, there's a lot of polarization of opinion and, and also demonization of people. And so uh, I think, you know, to negotiate, you have to kind of remember that people have their reasons for what they're doing and you have to look at both sides. So are you saying that Blinken, Tony Blinken was not willing to give that option? Uh, uh, right. it, it was never on the table. The US isn't going for that. That, yeah. that, that option has to be Ukraine's choice. Whether they choice. Correct, yeah, right. It had to be on the table and uh, you know, for whatever reason, he, he uh, from what I've read about Tony Blinken, he's, he's not a great negotiator. He did a very poor job with China negotiating. Um, I think he's not a, a strong person to be leading negotiations. So uh, that might have been an error in the US strategy as well. Okay, well, now, Jay. Uh, I'd just like to uh, jump in on that one. You yes. know, um, maybe it's not a failure of negotiation, maybe it's a strategy. Uh, remember, the USSR collapsed trying to keep up the United States as far as military spending and they couldn't sustain it and that was led to the ultimate collapse of Russia or USSR uh, I'm not saying this is a similar strategy but there's more to it than what the eye seems to see here in this negotiation 
I so that has to do. Okay. Oh, Karen, do you want to respond? I just wanted to say, in other words, you're thinking maybe the strategy was to uh, bring Russia down or to um, kind of collapse Russia by overspending. I, I, if not by military spending, certainly by pu world public opinion. Oh, could be. Okay, well, I, Jay, um, I I feel like you might might want an or in on this discussion of um, the NATO issue. Um, do do you have have follow up comments on that point? Well, as I said last show and this show, I disagree with Karen. Um, I, you know, the you know, even if NATO has more people applying to it and they apply, um, the boundaries haven't changed. Nobody's pushing a boundary here. It's they just a. It was originally a Western European organization, and now they've pushed into Eastern Europe and closer. They haven't pushed anywhere. It's an agreement, is all it is. No boundary has changed. No aggression has taken place. I mean, there's a big difference between having an agreement for defense purposes and how about killing a country that's the largest country in Central uh, Europe? Um, well, you know, I, I don't I don't buy that at all, Karen. Um, and, I, and I don't think the United States or Ukraine has ever taken any steps to change that eastern boundary. Furthermore, now that he mentioned that he's a, a nuclear power, we already knew that uh, we find in the newspaper that, in fact, he has twice as many nuclear bombs as we do. So who's the aggressor here? Who's the guy that's rattling the saber? Well, Who's I the guy we should be it. worried about? It isn't the United States, and it isn't Ukraine, and it isn't NATO. The, Ru the Russians have this, uh, this ridiculous dream uh, to recreate the USSR. That's old news. Um, the fact is that we are, we are defensive. We are trying to keep the peace. We are not aggressive. We, we would not do anything like what he is doing in Ukraine, which is a travesty and a war crime. I, I don't put that as two positions to be considered. I mean, it's, that's like, uh, you know, Trump saying, let's let's negotiate that the election was stolen. One of those two, two positions is poppycock. And, uh, you know, I think it's poppycock to say that NATO is a threat to, to uh, Ukraine. He just wants more land. And he has he has no morality, whatever. And well, he doesn't mind killing people. And that's a completely different affair than NATO or the US or any country in Western Europe. Now, if you talk to the people in Western Europe, they will all agree with what I'm saying. Well, well you know, Poland, Poland is a member of NATO. Is that a good thing? Uh, will, will, Putin, will that be a, a stopping point if, if, if Putin takes Ukraine? Won't that be a stopping point before Article 5 of the NATO Charter kicks in if, Poto, if, if, if Poland is entered? Yes. Uh, what's Article 5? Let's but that, that's not, that's aggression. Uh, it's like the three aggression by... one for all and all for one. Yeah, it's, it, it uh, means all, that all Europe and the in. United States, the other members of NATO, uh, will protect Poland. And that means going into Poland, boots on the ground, and actually having a war in Poland. And, um, you know, uh, who are they talking about? They're talking about Russia. They're not concerned that Finland is going to come in. Uh, they're talking about Russia. Russia is the aggressor here. So, um, you know, um, I don't think it'll happen with Poland. But, you know, the people in Poland are afraid. The people in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they're all afraid. You talk to anybody in, in Western Europe and they'll tell you that, that these, uh, you know, Eastern Europe boundary countries are all afraid and they're afraid not only of an invasion such as Ukraine, but like an invasion through nuclear means. Um, well, I... We are at a crisis here and there is a right and a wrong. And what exactly could you negotiate? What do you want to do? You know, draw a line through Ukraine and give half of it away? Uh, speaking on behalf of people who don't agree with that, what do you want to do? Um, you know, what are the possibilities? Make an agreement to say you'll never join NATO. That that leaves that leaves Russia with the opportunity of taking you over any time and being you know protected against any possibility of boots on the ground from NATO. Um, you know, neither of those is a worthy possibility. And well, I think that I think that uh, Blinken is right. I think Blinken has taken a kindly attitude. He's open for discussion. But frankly, if I put all of us in the room there in that discussion, 
What are we supposed to negotiate? What were they supposed to negotiate in the meetings a couple of days ago in Belarus? What's to negotiate? Either you're going to crush my country or not. Well, Jay, I think that what you're addressing here is another the answer to another question, which is, um, is, Rus is Russia or Putin satiated by only taking Ukraine? Is that the end of his? Well, most of most of Europe does not believe it will stop at Ukraine. All right, uh, Tim, what do you what's your take on? Well, uh, Karen was trying to get something, um, get her point across. So I, I defer to Karen in her comment. Right, Karen, could you comment? Okay. I, as I said, I think it's possible to both sides be true. Does it mean that I'm supporting Putin and his militarization? And that it's great, you know, go Putin or something like that. But I do think the U.S. has its own blame in the situation, and you can't ignore that. What he was trying to negotiate was that the states around you, uh, Russia would remain neutral and wouldn't have military. Yeah, forces. but Karen, would, you know, um, Putin changed his mind. He, you know, at first he said, I just want to make sure Ukraine's neutral and it doesn't become a member of NATO. He's changed his tune. He now says, I want pre-1997 borders established or, or, or agreements established. So he wants those countries that have signed up with NATO since 1997, he wants that all reversed. Uh, that's crazy thinking. And don't forget, don't forget Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons. They had nuclear weapons and they gave up the nuclear weapons. They gave them all to Russia. Uh, so, uh, you know, Ukraine is like a, a peace nation. Ukraine had never attacked Russia. So I, I don't know what the problem is here. Let me, let me go to another point that's an oblique, Karen, and that is this. We have a substantial number of people in this country who follow Trump. Nobody will deny it. Uh, whether that's more or less on a given day because of one, you know, remarkable gaffe or another, fact is a lot of people support him. And, and his principal point on this is that, um, is that uh, Putin is clever. Let's support Putin. Uh, the, he had a crowd shouting at the top of the lungs the other day, uh, Putin, Putin, Putin. I say to myself, it's a, it's a really good thing. I didn't have a meal before I saw that. <laughs> because I would have lost it all over the kitchen floor. Um, you know, this is these are Americans who have been raised in the civil, uh, I shouldn't say civil war, in the Cold War uh, to understand we are in a nuclear contention with this country. Um, and and we, we survived for a long time on the basis of deterrence. Well, in many ways, uh, Russia is ahead of us on nuclear weapons now. Um, and they have numbered cities in Siberia uh, where nuclear scientists are, you know, developing other nuclear weapons and missiles. I mean, should we not be concerned about that? Should we not be concerned that, that Trump, uh, you know, sucks up to Putin and compliments him and believes he's right? I mean, that is, I don't, I don't know how to say this, but um, it's tantamount, as many things Trump has done, um, to, uh, to, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, wait, it'll come to me. Well, we, uh, it's the opposite of patriot. Yeah, well, it's the opposite of patriotism. Right. It's treason. It's, it's treason. You know, we are now in a cold war. Yes. I hope you got that. We are in a cold war. And Trump is sucking up to Putin, telling everyone that Putin's right, and having them call out his name. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's treason. And, and it's recent, and it's recent. It's within this context. So we have a question that I that we can insert now. So um, Tim, um, I'll come back to you, and I'll read the question, and um, you can uh, give us some comments on that, and and others too. Um, the question is: Given that you think Putin has waged this Ukraine war to recreate the glory days of the USSR, do you do you think that means that other non-historical USSR countries have nothing to fear? And in, and if no, what do we in the U.S. have to fear? Okay, great question. Um, if you're a former Soviet satellite country and you're not part of NATO, you have everything to fear. Just like Ukraine. You are no different than Ukraine because there's nothing in a charter that says you will receive the protection of NATO and its nations. Uh, as far as US, uh, the United States, we are back, I agree with Jay, we are back in a Cold War. 
that means there's going to be uh, aggression. And we already know that Putin uh, tried to compromise our free and fair election in 2016, and to some extent, 2020. Uh, what is that all about? That's called a Cold War. It's just we haven't been calling it a Cold War, but it is. So great question. And yeah, those nations, uh, they should be very concerned. And I'd be in a hurry to sign up with NATO, frankly. Uh -huh. uh, do you, Karen, do you um, agree that in the US we have much to fear, even though we have these two big oceans and, uh, and a big uh, bunch of guns? So what do you respond to this question with? What's I guess my greatest fear is the report that came out on global warming and how um, you know, we're at a critical point and how this is distracting from our ability to work together, uh, uh, these different countries to try to stop global warming because I really feel that they should settle this diplomatically, move on and not try to do it militarily, which is, you know, the US is sort of known for it, but um, What's just, the settlement, Karen? The settlement is we just agree that um, Ukraine will remain neutral, you know, and uh, I haven't seen to um, uh, to the other point, I haven't really seen the latest thing about uh, pushing back to an earlier period, but I do know that Putin has been pushing back ever since um, we started NATOizing the Eastern Europe, so I haven't seen his recent comments. But I do think that it's not really worth it. You know, I think we, our focus should be on, we say to them that, you know, Ukraine will be neutral. There will be no war. They don't have to be killed. And then, you know, basically we go back to really what we need to focus on is climate change. Well, we, Karen, does that mean that, that Russia pulls out of Ukraine to get to that? Yeah, that I think so. Yeah, right. if, neutral, if we agree to, uh, yeah, it would, would be part of the agreement would be pulling out. Yeah. And there okay. would be operations. Uh -huh. So it's like it's like one of those uh, old movies where you run it in reverse. So all the pieces of the building that were blown up, you know, actually yep. return. The building is recreated. All the people who were killed come back to life. All the, the automobiles and the trucks and the facilities that were destroyed are, you know, returned to their original condition. We have very little time left. So uh, let's just do one round, one final comment, trying to get to some closure here. So um, Jay, why don't you just give us a brief statement and uh, for a final comment here on this, uh, you know, a very muscular discussion. I'd say, uh, you know, Putin has crossed the Rubicon on this and we know more about him than we did a few days ago. We, we can connect the dots on where he wanted to go for a long time and where he is going and where he will go. And, um, and having, having understood that, having now understanding that, it seems to me that it's not only Putin has crossed the Rubicon, uh, Europe has crossed the Rubicon. Um, and for that matter, the United States, whether it likes it or not, and whether the Trump followers like it or not, we have crossed the Rubicon. The world has changed in one week, and it is not for the better. <clears throat> and I agree with Karen that this, has, this is sucking all the oxygen out of our most important story, uh, our, 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 our greatest existential threat. But the fact is that, uh, and a lot of people will die because of climate change, you know, arguably billions over time. But the immediate problem, regrettably, is that we are failing, we, all of us, every country, the human species is failing at maintaining a, a peaceful existence. But I blame that entirely, entirely on Putin. And I think one of the problems, the flaws in our species is that from time to time, we have autocrats, dictators, and monsters. That's what he is. And if you give Trump a chance, he'll be the same. Jim, comment? Uh, ditto to Jay, I mean, perfectly stated. Uh, I agree with Karen that it, diplomacy is certainly preferred over war. And uh, an elegant solution could be uh, that Ukraine becomes the next Switzerland, a neutral stated country. I, I don't think that satisfies Putin. I, I agree with Jay. He's this naked aggression and continued aggression will, will continue. And um, I don't think he'll be satisfied with, with pulling out of uh, Ukraine and and keeping it as a neutral country. I just don't think that's going to satisfy his his inner wishes and and, and it desires for uh, USSR country again. So um, more news at eleven, as they say. We'll see what happens. Yeah. 
Karen, your final comment for the show? Uh, okay, I, th I think this is very similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis, where uh, we kind of got too close to each other's borders, and uh, but and it was needs to be negotiated. Remember, Cuba was an independent state, so they had the right to put Russian missiles in there. But the U.S. Uh, but you know, basically was ready to bomb it because of these missiles. So it was resolved militarily or diplomatically, and I think rather than uh, and in fact. Uh, from what I've read, Kennedy himself uh, had to stand up against the military and say that they wanted to bomb Cuba. And he said, no, no, we're not bombing Cuba because he was afraid the next place to bomb would be Miami. If you know, if we bomb Cuba, then Russia would bomb Miami. So he didn't want to go there. And he uh, agreed to remove our um, missiles from Turkey uh, in exchange for them removing from Cuba. So I think there has to be something on the table to negotiate with them that allows us to settle it um, without military. I would, I would distinguish that. Nobody had crossed the border. Nobody had actually attacked. And the, re the resolution of it was, if you remember, the Russians pulled the missiles out of Cuba. That was the resolution. No, yeah, it, wasn't behind a sweet, the scenes, Jay, it wasn't behind a half, the scenes, half we, pulled, we pulled missiles out of Turkey, be, you know, months later, that was the site agreement. That was uh, the hush hush agreement. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Karen. This show is policy for the people. And uh, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton for this show each week. And uh, thank you participants uh, for in this uh, exciting discussion. So we'll see you next Thursday. Mahalo for viewing and aloha everybody.